Have you ever heard one of those reality TV singers cover a song? Every bond you break. And although it's technically correct, it feels a little karaoke-y, like it's missing something compared to the original. Well, bass is no different. The little details matter a lot. There are subtleties you might not even notice at first. But when you use these nuances to shape your bass lines, you can tailor the right emotion and feel for the song, which means you'll sound better and your playing will affect people more deeply. But most beginner and intermediate bassists aren't aware of the nuances, so they get stuck in the something's missing, bland, karaoke bassist zone, not really knowing why. All by myself. So in this video, I'll show you how to elevate your playing from X-Factor adequacy to nailing the nuances that make the pros sound pro, even if you're playing super simple bass lines. <laughs> We're gonna start with a couple beginner level nuances, but as we go, we'll get into the subtler realms that even intermediate players miss when they're learning or creating bass lines. One of the most impactful choices you can make as a bass player is whether to play your notes connected or disconnected. Even just subtracting or adding a fraction of a second in between notes can totally change the feel of the bass line and the whole song. Check it out. Noob Josh, can you play us Kryptonite by Three Doors Down? Psh, that song's so easy. It just goes like this. Sounds okay-ish, right? But something's a little off. Check out Todd Harrell's original performance. The notes continue all the way into the beginning of the next note. Compare that to Noob Josh's notes where you can hear and see the gaps in his note transitions. This matters because when you let your bass notes run into each other, it creates a more flowing feeling. It kind of allows the song to smoothly roll forward like you're gliding down a stream. You have to make a decision. How? How fast is your little stream? Because this is this is your world. Sometimes putting short notes in your bass line to interrupt that flow is a good idea. But if you're covering a song and the bass line already has long notes, it's not gonna sound right if you play short notes since the bass line has already been crafted to fit the song. You can hear the same kind of long connected notes in a song like I'll Be There by the Jackson 5. The bassist Ron Brown kept the notes flowing into each other to create a lyrical, melodic bass sound. And in Other Side by the Chili Peppers, Flea is maintaining the same flowing feeling with non-gappy connected notes. And you can hear how it breaks up the flow when he starts playing short notes in the bridge. So why do Noob Josh and other beginner bassists mess this up? Well, when you're learning bass, it takes a lot of coordination to get from one note to the next note. So you tend to start moving your hand way too early to get to that next note before it's actually time to play it. So like if I want this note to last a full one, two, three, four, and then change on one, but if I go one, two, three, shift, four, one, then I get like two beats of just dead space. And it's a natural reflex when you're starting out, but it ruins the ends of your notes if you're trying to keep them connected. The trick is to speed up your transitions. Don't think of it as gradually moving from one note to the other. Just imagine you have the power to jump instantly from point A to point B without traveling in between. Obviously, you can't really instantly move from one point to the other, but if you just make believe a little bit, it'll help you orient your movements. Let me show you how that looks real quick on Kryptonite, and also listen to how much better it sounds with the long notes that belong in the song, which keep the verse section flowing forward. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Syncing up with the drummer is the biggest thing you can do as a bass player to make your band sound tight. There are creative choices you can make about exactly how you do that, which I'll explain in a minute. But first I wanna focus on fundamentals because I frequently hear beginners and even intermediates failing to consistently, keyword, consistently flop with the drums even though they may technically be playing the right notes and the right rhythms. This is easiest to hear in bass lines with simple rhythms like Willie Nelson's On The Road Again. Noob Josh, will you grace us with a demo? Yeah, I can play that, it just goes like this. On the road again Going places that I've never been Seeing things that I may never see again 
right, bud, not your best effort. So he's playing the right notes and he's aiming for the right rhythms, but he's drifting in and out of sync with the drums. So everybody knows they should play in time and they think they are because they start synced up on beat one, which is easy because that's when you're paying attention. But the nuance that beginners and even intermediates miss is the notes after beat one inside the bar. You might sort of sound in time, but it gives the listener this feeling of like, ugh, something's not quite right. And that's why pro bassists always stay locked in with their drummers. Check out the original Willie Nelson bass and drum tracks. Every bass note is right on the beat with the kick drum, with some very slight human variation. You can see this again in Bad Moon Rising by CCR and Folsom Prison Blues by Johnny Cash. Locking in controls how tight a song or a band sounds, meaning it feels solid, steady, and just like chugging along like a train on the tracks. When the bass and drums drift apart, it feels disjointed and it kind of train wrecks, as you noticed when Noob Josh blew it. Hey! As a listener, you can't really dance or enjoy the song. This isn't about being perfectly metronomic with totally unchanging time, because not all music should be played to a click track. <laughs> It's about locking with the drummer, even if there's some change in tempo over time. Once you're able to lock consistently, you can sometimes intelligently push or pull the beat ever so slightly to create a different feel in the song. Without going into mega detail, here's a quick sample of what that does. So if you start by playing on the beat, which is what you should usually do, it just keeps chugging ahead on the tracks like normal. If you push slightly forward, you get a little more insistent driving, falling over the cliff feeling like this. Back to normal. And if you pull behind a hair, you can get a more laid back, kind of fashionably late to the party kind of vibe like this. But most of the time, bass players don't do this, and you need a really good foundation of consistency to be able to pull it off. So how do you get this consistency? Learn to keep your ears and feelers open to the drums on every single beat. Beginners miss this because they're so focused on wrangling the instrument, and that makes sense. So over time, you just gradually open up your awareness so you can hear yourself and the rest of the band. Bass lines like this with simple on the beat rhythm are a great way to start practicing this. And I also take you through more explicit rhythm training exercises in my beginner badass course, which you can learn more about over at BassBuzz.com. You can try that with me now if you want, or you can just listen. We'll just play through this chunk of On the Road again and keep our ears open to the drums no matter what. Here we go. One, two, three, four. On the road again. Going places that I've never been. Okay, time to get into more intermediate stuff, and I'm happy to say that playing our intermediate examples will be Noob Josh. Wow. I'd just like to thank everybody for this honor and remind you to click like and subscribe to Bass Buzz for more great bass lessons. <clears throat> okay, enough. End of speech. One of the ways pro bassists transform vanilla notes into spicy chocolate notes is by using subtle bass slides. These give the notes some life and they help mimic the expressiveness of the human voice, which naturally goes up and down. You can hear how important this is in Yellow by Coldplay. Take it away, Intermediate Josh. He's really come a long way, hasn't he? But what's he missing? There's supposed to be a tasty little slide there in Guy Berryman's original part, which adds a kind of dreamy vibe. There are the big dramatic bass slides of the world, but the ones we get to use in bass lines tend to be the more subtle ones like this. Bad Decisions by The Strokes has some similarly subtle slides that help Nikolai Freytour's bass line pop out. And as I discussed at length in my five levels of Smells Like Teen Spirit video, Chris Novoselic whips out a couple small slides that give his bass line a lot more character. Vanilla is plain. It isn't necessarily bad, but sometimes a bass line needs something more, like some chocolate sauce drizzled on top. A small slide might seem small, but it adds important flavor and movement, and it's one of the little nuances that add up to make the difference between a straightforward bass line and a more expressive one. The trick to pulling these off is to choose the right fingerings that build the slides naturally into the flow of the line. So in this chorus part from yellow, that means you should shift up to play those ninth fret notes with your index finger, and then you can naturally get that slide back down to the sixth fret, which leaves you in position 
to get back to your starting note. Noob Josh's mistake was he played it all in position like this, and then there's nowhere to slide. You also have to choose your shapes well. If we moved that G sharp on the sixth fret of the D string to the 11th fret of the A string like this, then there'd be no slick way to slide down to it because of the string crossing. So if you're trying this out in another bass line, you might need to move the notes around and see what works best. Let's go through this with the track and slide it up. One, two, three, This is a super slick move that I didn't learn until I started doing recording work in studios. Cutting for the snare means ending whatever note you're currently holding whenever the snare drum hits, which is usually on beats two and four. It can make the band sound less muddy and more clear and separated, which recording engineers really like. You can hear this move in action on Credence Clearwater Revival's Proud Mary. Intermediate Josh, I can play CCR in my sleep. All right, what's Intermediate Josh missing? Here's his bass track with the drums. See how these notes keep hanging on after the snare hits? Compare that to Stu Cook's original bass track where the bass cuts off right with the snare, or at least close. Most people listening to a band would have no idea whether you're cutting for the snare or not on a conscious level, but whether it's a live concert or a recorded track, that increased clarity in the mix will make everything feel better and be less frustratingly noisy even for the average listener so they can get on with dancing and bobbing their heads. A messy mix is like having mud splattered on your song and you can't like see or hear what's underneath it. You can hear Jeff Lynne use the same move on Tom Petty's Free Fallen. So how do you actually cut for the snare? The mechanics are pretty simple. When the snare drum hits, you release the pressure of your fretting finger, and then you cover the strings to keep them quiet, either with your fretting fingers, with your plucking hand, or both. Cutting for the snare works best on bass lines with a somewhat broken up rhythm. So if you're playing like straight chugging, it doesn't really factor in. But if you have a rhythm like one, two, and three, four, and one, or one, two, and three, and four, and one, or one, two, and three, and, and one. Then it works great because those rhythms don't hit where the snare does on two and four. So this is something to experiment with. It's not always the right move for the song, but if you're working on a bass part and something just doesn't quite feel right, this might make the difference. Just listen to how crisp and clean and clear the vibe is cutting those bass notes tight with the snare on Proud Mary. One, two, three, four. So you're chugging along, you're locked in with the drummer, but somehow it's just not rocking hard enough. That's when a pro would use down picking, which is doing all down strokes with the pick like this. This gives you a driving consistent attack with more forward momentum. It's really great for like chugging eighth notes, or quarter notes, and it just makes you turn on your bass face and you can't turn it off even if you're filming a bass lesson. Ugh. It feels different because rather than naturally getting a two note accent pattern like you would going down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, you get every note getting attacked the same. Down, 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 down. You can hear this on a lot of driving rock songs like Best of You by the Foo Fighters. Hit it, Intermediate Josh. All right, that sounded pretty good, right? Right notes, right rhythm, didn't miss anything marked in the sheet music. But let's listen to just Noob Josh's, sorry, Intermediate Josh's bass. And now here's Nate Mendel's actual bass track. Down picking makes a bass line feel consistent and insistent and persistent and other words like that. It's a subtle shift that can make a song or even part of a song feel more relentless and in your face like Bruce Lee straight blasting you in the face. One of the classic-ist downpicking bands was the Ramones. I would guess that just about every one of Dee Dee Ramone's bass lines were all downpicked. Check out how that drives the punk vibe on a song like Blitzkrieg Bop. If you're playing with your fingers, the equivalent would be one finger plucking. 
It's a super common session player trick, which I talk about in more detail in my rules pros break video. So test this out on some of your own bass lines and you may find that they start to feel more consistent and exciting, but there's not always a right or wrong option because different technique choices just evoke different feelings. There's only a right or wrong way to do it if you're trying to emulate something specific. So here's how best of you should sound with all down picking. Here we go, one, two, three, four. Note length, rhythmic loft, slides, cutting for the snare, down picking are just a few of dozens of creative choices you can make to level up your bass lines. To sound pro and not noob or intermediate, start listening for the little stuff. When you hone your awareness to catch these little details, you can start to control your playing to get the exact right vibe for the song. And pro bassists don't think any bass line is beneath them. Because they listen carefully to their playing for subtle nuances and details, they find the challenge in every bass line to give it that extra sparkle. Speaking of sparkle, how's that metal feeling, noob Josh? So good, it's, wait, wait, where is it? I lost it, oh no! Oh shoot, I hope you can still play your intermediate Josh jams. Let me try. Oh man, I'm a noob again.